So welcome. Um, this is my fourth in-person event so far this year. So it's asymptotically closer to normal the more of these I do. But um, the joy of being in a physical room with physical people and being able to look around the room and talk to people and, and you know, see faces has not diminished even a tiny bit. So I'm glad you're all here. I wanted to start with that. Um, second, just kind of a level setting question. How many of you have ordered a new MacBook Pro? Anybody? Damn it, I was looking for one I could steal, and it looks like I struck out on that one. So for those of you I haven't met, my name is Paul Robichaud. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Product Management at Quest Software. I've been an MVP since 2002, and I'm one of the editors of the Practical 365 website. Now for those of you that have been around a while, you probably remember that Practical 365 originally was started by a gentleman named Paul Cunningham, who was a longtime old school MVP. And eventually he decided that the, you know, the burden of trying to be the uh, the best source of truth or source of practical knowledge about exchange was just too hard. So he wanted to sell the website. He sold it to Quadratech, where I was working at the time. And we kept it editorially independent. Um, and then when Quest bought Quadratech, now Quest is managing it. So it's good and bad. Or it's good because Quest is a very large company, has a lot of resources to put behind it, and we're continually on the hunt for new content and new authors. So I have a little commercial that I'm going to do later about encouraging people who haven't written for community sites to come make a few bucks and have a good time writing for us. But the bad part of it is, you know, it's a bigger, complicated um, enterprise than it used to be. Uh, the other good part about it is we have this really amazing illustrator named Rory Walker who does custom art for all of our posts. He also does children's books. So when you look at his illustration style, I love, love, love the illustrations that he does for us and one of my favorite parts of the site. But what we're trying to do with Practical 365, and I guess I didn't put a formal agenda in. What I'm going to do is give you a brief commercial and show you a few highlights of the site, and then go over the top 10 articles on the site traffic, you know, based on our traffic. Um, I think you will see some surprises in there. There will be some things that probably won't surprise those of you who have been around for a while. But then I want to talk about the practical impact of each of those articles just a little bit. So what we're trying to do is find a middle path between sites that do a lot of shouting about whatever Microsoft is doing. Sometimes that's just retransmitting what Microsoft says. So for example, there are news sites that every time Microsoft posts a, this is what's new in Teams in October 2021 article, these news sites will report on it and link to it. Well, that doesn't really add a lot of value, right? Then on the far end of the spectrum, you have kind of the classical old school MVPs. I think of people like Vasil Mishev, Vasil might write one article a year on his blog, but when he does, oh my God, it's like a concrete block, right? It's gonna be super dense, super technical, super valuable if you can understand it. What we wanted to try to do is hit the middle between those and talk about news where it's important and help people understand where the market, if you will, is going, where Microsoft is going, but also give people stuff that they can do something with, right? It's right in the name. We want everything that we talk about, everything that we post, to be practical. So for those of you who have seen Tony Redmond's articles on the site, he does a really good job of striking that balance because Microsoft will do something and Tony will come out and give an opinion, right? Because he's Tony, of course he will have an opinion. But then usually there will be a PowerShell script or some code in GitHub or there will be a thing that you can use to do something about whatever it is he just gave you an opinion on. And that's kind of the balance we're trying to hit. So we focus on real world scenarios, um, but beyond the articles, you know, we have, we have blogs, we have a, an active, ongoing podcast, which is actually a lot of fun if you haven't seen it before, because Steve Goodman, my co-host, um, is not only a funny guy, but has a terrific radio voice. We do videos. Uh, we're starting to do more things at live events. This is sort of a test balloon to see if we get up and talk about site content in a room as opposed to doing it online, does anybody care? Do we get anything, you know, does the community get anything value, valuable out of it? Do we get anything valuable out of it? So when you think about what 365 means, right, different people have very different opinions. I've had multiple arguments with my brother because he works for Microsoft on the Dynamics 365 team. And when I say 365 and when he says 365, we're not talking about the same thing, right? Those of you who have worked with Dynamics know what I mean. So for the site, what we're primarily focused on are Azure AD, because that's the identity substrate that underlays everything that we do. Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, and OneDrive for Business. Really heavy focus on Teams, and then stuff that you can do with PowerShell and Graph. 
This doesn't mean we don't talk about shifts, we don't talk about planner, we do, but those aren't the main focus areas. What we've seen over time is teams went from being kind of, I don't know, bottom of the top 10 in terms of what people were interested in, zoomed up to the top. And I think if you were to plot our site traffic looking at Teams content, you'd see it tracks very closely to the uptake in Teams that we saw starting like February, March, 2020, right? Which is to be expected. What's maybe more interesting is that SharePoint interest has pretty much held steady. Now, that's interesting because the number of users on SharePoint, the amount of data in SharePoint, the number of, you know, the amount of revenue Microsoft is making from SharePoint, those are all increasing but we don't see a corresponding increase in demand for content in talking about SharePoint. That could mean a couple of different things. One is that people don't care, and that's clearly not it. The other is that they already have news outlets or places to get practical information about SharePoint that they, that they already like, right? So we're always trying to look at, are there other areas we should focus on? But for right now, these really seem to hit the sweet spot of information that people can actually use to make their environments better. So our site reach, our marketing people made me put this in, but you can see, you know, the primary, our traffic is primarily in the areas where you would expect it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the content types and give you some examples of uh, what they look like before I get into the good stuff. So for blogs, almost everybody we have writing for the site is an MVP. Uh, we have some very good, talented people who are not yet MVPs. But for the most part, what we want to do is try to find people who are knowledgeable in a specific area and, and work with them to figure out, okay, what practical guidance do you have for people that you don't think is currently being covered someplace else? You know, because we don't want to just reiterate what's in Microsoft Docs. We don't want to reiterate what other people are talking about. We don't want to have the 10th article on, oh, this is how you make a simple adaptive card, because there are plenty of places for people to get that information already. So as an example, you know, this is very clearly just from the title, you can tell this is a Tony Redmond joint because he, instead of just saying new distribution group, let me talk about it, it's new distribution group and I have an opinion on its value. This actually was an extremely popular article um, because it gave people some practical guidance on the fact that, oops, the vulnerabilities that all of y'all should have patched in Exchange 2016, obviously somebody didn't get that memo because attackers are still getting into those systems. Okay, a uh, fairly recent article, using PowerShell to manage CA policies. This is exactly the kind of stuff that we like to publish. Because yeah, everybody who knows that conditional access policies exist know that you can manage them in the portal, right? But there's some things that you can do at scale or things that you can do that the portal didn't make easy that you can do with PowerShell. But still what we find, um, how, how many of you have been administering Office 365 for longer than three years, let's say? Okay, longer than five years? How many of you worked on BPOS? Man, we got some grizzled survivors in here, I love it. So one of the things that a lot of people in our position, and I include myself in you know, this group of people that have been working on this for a while, one of the things we tend to forget sometimes is that as this market gets bigger, right, it's literally like the fireball from a nuclear explosion because where, as that fireball grows, what happens is it sucks up stuff from the ground, right? Well, as the Office 365 fireball gets bigger, that metaphor didn't really go where I wanted, but work with me. Then <laughs> It's pulling in people who don't have enterprise admin experience. Now, many of them are gonna be working at smaller tenants, right? So how many people who work with small tenants do you think already are comfortable and fluid in PowerShell? Not very many, right? How many of those people who can spell PowerShell and are not afraid of it are comfortable enough to use it to manage CA policies? Eh, maybe not many, right? So. Even though some of this content you look at it, you go, well, duh, who doesn't know how to do that? You would be surprised at how many people don't know how to do that, even among people who are experienced admins, because, next audience participation question, how many of you came into 365 for managing Exchange on-prem or Exchange online and then ended up with all the other workloads dumped on your plate, right? That's a super common path. And so there's no, you know, there's no guarantee that just because you're managing the entire estate of 365 that you've been exposed equally to all the technologies that make it up. Okay, passwordless. How many of you have heard Microsoft talking about passwordless this, passwordless that, right? It's a term that's on their lips a lot lately as part of their push to make everything zero trust. I've switched over my Windows Live account to use it and I love it. It works flawlessly, it works on my Xbox, I get authentications on my watch. 
it, it just makes the whole process simpler. And I love not having to worry that my password will be compromised or that I'll forget it as I get older, right? And of course, this was a sad day. I hope everybody celebrated it in a, the appropriate manner. But um, those are some examples of things that we have. Now, I have sort of a welcome message for Steve that I was going to play. I'm not a big fan of playing videos in um, sessions like this, but I'm going to just so everybody can hear how awesome Steve sounds when he talks. Oh, except, yeah, I forgot to plug in my audio because I forgot that I was playing any videos. And fun fact, this laptop does not have a headphone jack, so never mind. You don't get to hear Steve. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, he's just talking away, though, isn't he? All right, be quiet, Steve. So if you're on Twitter and you want to at him to tell him, hey, Steve, sorry you're not here, that would be mean because he's in the UK. He's not allowed to come here yet. So please, seriously, don't do that. But maybe you could tell him that nobody got to hear his message because I'm a moron. That would be OK. OK, we also have a podcast. Uh, this is a lot of fun. I want to start by saying any of you who have something interesting that you would like to talk about on a podcast, please come see me. We're always looking for guests. Um, from the industry to talk about industry trends, to talk about things that are happening. We recently, I love doing this, uh, recently had Greg Taylor on to talk about the upcoming, ongoing, maybe one of these days, death of basic authentication. So for those of you that haven't been tracking, that got pushed off and pushed off and pushed off, and now it's not pushed off anymore. It's happening. They're already turning it off for new tenants. Uh, one thing that you may not know if you haven't been reading Greg's stuff or you haven't seen this podcast episode, they're actually turning it off randomly. Yeah, which is, that, that's a pretty neat move. That's the old style screen test, right? Where you turn something off and see, does anybody complain that you turned it off? If not, then cool, you can leave it turned off. Um, five years ago, Microsoft would not have done that. You know, they would have said, well, you need to turn it off. You need to turn it off. They wouldn't have just said, no, sorry, we're turning it off. Hope you're okay with that. Okay, I'm really sorry that I can't show you this because this was us using Teams Walkie Talkie on a literal racetrack at uh, Commsverse. So if you have YouTube and you look at Practical 365, you can see this. But examples of the kinds of content that we want to put out to people because not everything should be, not everybody is interested in another article about how to use PowerShell to tweak something. Right? One of the things we've learned in running this site is that, um, and I guess this, this is a good opportunity to ask too, because I'm curious. How many of you, if you had a choice between a blog article that explains something and a video that explained the same thing, how many of you would prefer the video? Okay. How many of you would prefer the article? How many of you don't care and you would use either depending on what you were doing? Okay. I, I have a confession to make. I hate watching videos. Right? I would 10 times rather read something, unless the video is showing me something visual that I need to see, like how to remove a part or how to fly a maneuver at an airplane. Um, I would always, always, always rather read it. But it turns out that I'm a dinosaur, and there are many people who would rather see things in video form. And so we're, you know, we're trying to make sure that we cover okay, those people. Like to skip over the garbage. You can't skip over the garbage in the video. This is true. Now, what you can do is play it at like one and a half X, right? Sometimes that helps. So among our other videos, you guys would be amazed at how long Steve spent doing this um, as a background for Teams. So I'm not encouraging you to spend your time looking at Steve's Lego videos, but you know it's not a bad thing. But as an example of some of the other kind of videos we had, we did a uh, really interesting interview with the two guys at Accenture that own their Teams deployment, where they support more than 500,000 global users. And got some really practical feedback on what they're doing around Microsoft Teams rooms, how they're trying to build their offices to allow the resumption of hybrid work for everybody. Because when you think about it, Accenture didn't have office space for 500,000 people before the pandemic, right? Well, guess what? They're certainly not going to buy 500,000 know, you office seats worth of space for people now. So what are they doing to facilitate that to make sure that everybody who needs to be in the office can be in the office when they need to? And more importantly, how are they taking advantage of Microsoft's technologies to make that possible? Okay, enough blathering about the site and how cool it is and so on. So in 2020, um, I asked our ops team to pull these numbers together because I wanted to give everybody a taste for what scale looked like last year. Um, you know, ballpark, we're going just under three quarters of a million impressions per month, which is 
nothing compared to you know Breitbart or People magazine, but it's, it's a pretty significant amount. And if you look back over time, what you're gonna see for these top 10, and I'll forewarn you now, for these top 10 items, um, some of them are old, right? So you probably have all heard of Chris Anderson, the guy who came up with the, the theory or the concept of the long tail, right? There are always gonna be a lot of content that's very time limited, if you will, but then as time moves on, people want to be able to find old articles or buy old magazine copies or get old books from the library. And the more content you make, the bigger that long tail gets over time, right? You can think of it like a bell curve where there's a big swelling in the curve over toward the, the new end. But as time marches on, that long tail gets longer and longer and you can still be profitable and still you know, pick a, a, a good market area where you're only serving content in that long tail. Secondhand bookstores are a great example. Look at all the people that are making money selling vintage stuff on eBay or Etsy or what have you, right? I mean, there's a market out there for it. So if you look across these numbers, I want you to keep these numbers in mind in terms of what a typical year looks like when we talk about this content. So our 10th most popular article was from this year, and it was Steve doing a hands-on with the CarPlay feature for Teams. How many of you have cars where you use CarPlay? So I love it, and I was excited when this showed up on the roadmap, and then I wondered where the hell it was for the next two years, right? I know we've all had that feeling. Uh, the Teams team is really good about committing to things on the roadmap, but as big as they are and as hard as they work, they still can't do everything, and they have other priorities or other you know, exigencies that come out. So it's not always a one-for-one -one swap. You could say, well... Um, you know, sorry, we didn't get the team stuff done because we had to take all the engineers who were working on it and have them work on service scalability to handle the pandemic. That's not exactly how it works, but it is fair to say that if they prioritize, if they, when they rebalance their priorities, if they increase the priority of one thing, that necessarily means the priority for some other thing is going to have to decrease. So when they shipped CarPlay, everybody was all excited. Uh, Steve drove around with it in his car and put it to the test. And the takeaways that I would leave with you from that test are, Microsoft did deliver what they promised. They said they would support CarPlay, and they do. But it's not the same fidelity of experience that you get with the native messaging clients on iOS or Android or Telegram or WhatsApp because you can't do anything with messages. You can join your next meeting. Right, that's pretty simple. You hit the voice button and say, join my next meeting. But if you have two meetings at the same time, guess what? You don't get to pick. Um, if you want to call somebody, you can if they're a contact. You can answer calls, but that's pretty much it. So the scenario you probably all had in mind of, oh, I'm going to run out and grab a hamburger during this boring meeting, and if anybody texts me, then I can pretend to be engaged, you'll still need your phone for that, right? Except not in California or Washington where you're not supposed to have a phone in your hand, but and they haven't said anything about what they're going to do in future, right? I think the, how do I want to put this? The path that they could take is really clear when you look at other messaging apps that are properly integrated into CarPlay. Right. Are they going to do all those things? I don't know. Are they going to do the same level of integration with Android Auto? I don't know that either because they haven't said publicly. Okay, number nine. Now, this is a funny one because our you know, ninth most popular article goes all the way back to 2015. So think about the messaging landscape in 2015. People still had a lot of on-prem servers. Uh, we didn't have Outlook 2016 with all of its sync improvements. And yet people still wanted to know how they could increase the size limit on messages in the service. We knew how to do that on-prem, right? Because you could do it at the mailbox, you could do it at the connector, you could do it at the mailbox database. But it was not at all clear how you would do that in the cloud world when there were no connectors that you were allowed to touch and there were no mailbox databases that you could see. So it turns out the way to do that is to use mailbox plans. Now, something interesting that I noticed this morning, we published an article yesterday on Practical 365 about more details of interesting things that you can do with mailbox plans. So that's a good example of, even though this content is old, it's still applicable, right? Mailbox plans are still what you use if you want to change the sender receive size limits. And Microsoft, although they've changed mailbox size limits, they've changed a lot of other aspects of how message traffic flows. We still have the same 35 meg in, 35 meg out default limit unless you change it. So it's nice to see that you know, in a world where so many different things change, more or less at whim because of Microsoft, they at least have stuck to that. 
Okay, this is, um, how do I want to put this? When I was a boy, I used to love to go to my grandparents because they had these giant stacks of old newspapers and old National Geographics and old Time magazines. And so I loved reading you know, Time magazines from like 1966, 1967, before I was born. So I'm not saying that you get the same feeling of nostalgia looking at how to set certificates on a receive connector, because I'm curious, do any of you still have operating receive connectors in your environment? Okay. One guy who I'm not going to point and laugh at, but you can see this is a good example of it's a popular article, but the reason it's popular, the reason why it is where it is in the site stats is not because people are looking at it right now. It's because this long tail of people who have looked at it over and over again since 2016 have bumped it up to that level. Okay, this is one that I thought was interesting because this is not something that I knew anything about. Right? I like to think that I'm reasonably knowledgeable and I try to stay informed, but Microsoft is shoveling new features into the ecosystem faster than most of us can keep up with. Right? So one of the things I didn't know, and this is super relevant for those of you who are planning to go back to a hybrid work environment where you're going to have physical people and physical desks, Microsoft has built some tools to facilitate that. So in Outlook, sorry, I thought I had to sneeze. Um, in Outlook, on the web, what you can do now is you can see floor plans. So for example, you can say in building six in Aliso Viejo, we have these workplace, they, they call them workplaces, right? So for those of you who are familiar with room mailboxes, a workplace is like a room mailbox, but it's not necessarily a room because it could be a hot desk or a huddle room or a, a corner of the office that has an MTR in it or something like that, right? It's not necessarily a room in the traditional sense. but when you create workspaces and you assign them the metadata that you can set with set place, then people can find them, right? In the same way that you could have a room list to say, okay, I'm gonna pick a conference room. There's some additional metadata, plus Outlook has the ability to give you a floor plan. So why would you care about that? Well, think of the traditional scenario where you go into the same office building and you sit at the same desk every day. You probably don't need a floor plan for that. On the other hand, think of a scenario where you are occasionally going to one of a variety of locations that are leased from someplace like we work because your company doesn't have a physical office where you live anymore or where you have transitioned to a job where you are traveling to different work sites some of which you haven't been to before in that case a tool like this gets to be super valuable because you can use it to figure out okay i've got to have a meeting with three people while i'm here i need a space that accommodates four people and then I need to know how to get there so I don't wander around the hall looking lost and come into my meeting late, right? Some of us have probably done that in past times. Um, what's interesting about this is that Microsoft, how do I want to put this? They have a lot of room to continue to integrate things like this to enable hybrid work. So every time you hear a Microsoft executive get up and talk about what Microsoft is doing around hybrid work, Keep in mind that they're doing that themselves, right? I mean, Microsoft itself is transitioning to a world where their center of gravity may still be in Redmond, but an increasing percentage of their employee base is not going to be in Redmond. A couple weeks ago, I was at the South Coast Summit in the UK, and uh, Donna Sarkar, who some of you may know from her work on Windows Insider, and who now runs the accessibility team there, said that none of her team is in Redmond. And when she said to them, hey team, it looks like pandemic restrictions are starting to loosen up a little bit and I got approval from my management to relocate anybody who wants to come to Redmond. All 12 people on our team were like, oh hell no. No, we don't want any of that. We want to stay where we are. I think you're going to see that become the model and I think you're going to see Microsoft continue to invest in making that hybrid experience better by putting improvements in the service. Some of them will be useful and popular. Some of them will be useful and not popular. Some of them will not be useful, right? Because they're figuring this out on the fly, just like the rest of us are. Okay, permanently removing deleted users. Well, this is kind of falls in a gray area, right? Because on the one hand, it's a 2015 article. So you might look at that publication date and say, eh, nobody needs this. On the other hand, sometimes you really and truly do want a user account gone. Right? This is like the scorch switch for old versions of Link and its predecessors. 
you want that account gone, you want it removed, you do not want it retained in the dumpster, you want all of its entitlements gone, you want its GUID gone, you just want it gone. So the only way to do that is with the remove Azure AD MS deleted directory object commandlet. Now, I, I would be willing to bet most of you have not had occasion to run into that commandlet or even had seen it before, right? I know that I didn't, um, which tells me two things. One is that Microsoft, I always have to be careful because I don't want Larry to like pop up from behind the bench and write me down on the bad list. Microsoft obviously doesn't see a strong customer need to be able to permanently delete objects or they wouldn't hide it behind this commandlet that nobody's heard of, right? There would be a checkbox or something in the portal that says really for true, permanently, totally, irrevocably remove this object. And they don't do that. So why don't they do that? Well, either they don't think there's a demand for it or there are good operational reasons not to let people do that. As you can imagine, how many support calls they would get if they had that checkbox and people checked it and then called and said, oh, you know, this account I removed, it turns out that actually belonged to the boss and now I need to get it back. Or we thought this guy was leaving, but we made him a counter offer and now he came back and now I need all his old OneDrive data. So good reasons for them not to turn it on, but you may have a good reason to know how to do it. So this last bullet, only do this if you're really, 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 really sure, because the only way that you're gonna get that object back is to restore it from a backup. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and I say this because one of the products that I manage is an Azure AD backup tool. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say most of you probably aren't backing up your Azure AD right now. So only use this commandlet if you really and truly mean it. Okay, this is a hot topic uh, because this is, this is pretty fresh uh, from last month. Microsoft announced that, oh, by the way, when we said that Exchange Online would have unlimited or bottomless archives, we didn't really mean that. We found the bottom and that is 1.5 terabytes. So this to me was a great example of people very quickly getting outraged over something that has minimal impact to most of us. Okay, because on the one hand, yes, until recently the documentation literally did say that these were bottomless archives and Microsoft has always publicly described them as being infinitely expandable. And vendors who make archiving software, including Quest, have depended on that because we want to be able to take somebody's you know, terabytes of archived crap in Enterprise Vault, let's say, or Source One, and move it to their expandable archive. And Microsoft said, that's totally great. It's a bottomless archive. It would be like if you went to Olive Garden every day for a year and you ate as many of the breadsticks as you wanted, then you went in one day and they're like, no, 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 you only get six breadsticks now. Would that harm you? No, probably not. Right? It's not like you were going to walk out hungry. Would you be mad? Yeah, probably. So people were mad about this when Microsoft announced this change. Um, it's their prerogative as the owner of the service. They have the ability to unilaterally make changes like that. I think on balance, they do a good job of not using that power recklessly, I think I would say. Um, if I hadn't based this talk around the top 10 articles, this would be a great time to pivot and talk about the price increase in E3 and E5 licenses, right? How many of you, when you saw that, thought, well, you know, that's fair. They've given me a, just a butt ton of new features and they haven't charged up the prices in several years. Yeah, I saw one person kind of tentatively raise his hand. How many of you were mad? You're like, Satya has enough money already. Okay, y'all are atypical because the broad population, their reaction was very much why is Microsoft raising prices? This is just terrible. Well, I mean, yeah, crybabies, that, that's a strong word, but I don't think it's an incorrect one, right? It's totally fair to look at the cost versus benefit of every licensing change that Microsoft makes and ask yourself, is this worth paying for? My personal favorite example, Microsoft is gonna charge $10 per user per month for the Cortana meeting schedule, which is laughable. I love that feature. I would pay a dollar a month for it. I'd pay $2 a month. You might even be able to convince me to pay $5 a month. But telling me that I have to pay half the cost of an E3 license so I can have a mostly functional, uh, generally sort of reliable meeting scheduler, that's just not gonna happen, right? Um, so Microsoft doesn't always nail it when they come to these price increases or when they come to feature changes. We've just gotten so conditioned to the fact that they add new features and don't charge any money, uh, that it's, it's kind of a sting when they do something like this and take away something that they've given us, even though it may not impact us 
individually and directly. Okay, migrating Azure AD Connect. How many of you had to do this for real, where you had to move the DirSync tool set from one server to another? Okay, most of you. It's not a complicated process, but if you didn't already know how to do it, uh, until fairly recently, Microsoft's documentation, it was just not great. Right? It didn't walk through the process in enough detail to tell you clearly what you need to do. So that's, why, that's where this article came from. And Paul wrote it in 2016. There was no documentation that told you how to do it because Microsoft's assumption seemed to be you would never need to replace that server. If you had to, you would just restore from backup. And of course, there are a long list of reasons why that's not always possible. Starting with, oops, I don't have a backup, or oops, my backup is no good. So the, you know, build a new server, put it in staging mode, do the switchover process is pretty much unchanged. Now what has changed since then, this is a good example. What has changed since the original article was published is that Microsoft now has a configuration export import tool that you can use to move the configuration over. You used to have to do it yourself, right? So even though the stats are for the original version of this article, at the original version, there's a giant header at the top that says there's an updated version of this article. And that's the URL that I put in here so that nobody gets misdirected. But good concrete example of Microsoft recognizing somewhat belatedly that their documentation wasn't up to snuff. I think it's fair in general to say they'll document nearly anything that is not unsupported or dangerous or hazardous or bad, but only if they think that there's a need for it. And so if you ever have the chance to sit in the room with the document, documentation team or the engineering team around any Microsoft product, right? And I say this having worked with the Mac Office team, the Windows Office team, the Active Directory and Azure AD teams, the Teams team, every team I've ever worked with, it's not that they're unwilling to put documentation to tell people how to do things. It's just that sometimes they don't know that people don't know how to do things. They don't realize there's a need for a document to tell people how to do things. So why am I telling you this? Well, two reasons. One is if there's something that you know that needs to be documented, then come write an article for us about it. But the other is Microsoft has gotten so much better about taking documentation feedback than they used to be. Right, right on the docs site at the bottom of every page is an opportunity for you to send feedback. And the writers and engineers who write that documentation read that feedback and they do something about it, right? If you're comfortable with it, a lot of the documentation is actually in GitHub. You can submit your own pull request to make suggested changes to the documentation. You talk about a community service, right? For those of you who ever thought, oh, I wonder what I would need to do to be an MVP. That's exactly the kind of community contribution that looks really, really good to, this, to the uh, product group when they're looking at nominations. Plus, it's fun, right? It gives you that same lift of like picking up a you know, piece of garbage next to the path in the park. You're like, hey, I made the world a little tiny bit better. And I'm not even I'm being completely serious when I say that. It is rewarding to do that because if you don't do it, if you have that knowledge and you don't share it, who will? Right? You know, Microsoft can't get to everything. They can't pick up every piece of litter. Um, so if you can help, if you have the skills and the ability, then I encourage you to do it. Now, I was really surprised to see this particular article be at number three, because I know there are a whole lot of people out there who didn't patch their Exchange 2016 servers. You know how I know? Because I saw it on CNN, I saw it in the Wall Street Journal, I saw it in the New York Times. All these people who had their you know, to mix metaphors, they got beat up by the schoolyard bully and had their lunch money taken because they didn't patch their servers and they got shelled. There were a lot of customers in that situation. Now, we had some fascinating discussions internally in the MVP community and internally at Quest about why is this? And it turns out one reason is netware. Now, I don't literally mean netware. As much fun as it would be to blame this on Novell, Right, that would be like trying to kick a ghost. Um, but for those of you who worked with Netware, how much ongoing maintenance did your Netware servers need once they were in a stable state? Not much. You pretty much, as long as that server had power and nobody cut the coax to it, it was gonna keep working, right? Well, guess what? Microsoft did that to themselves with Exchange 2016 because in the majority of cases where the servers hadn't been patched, they didn't get patched because people didn't know they needed to be patched, either because people didn't realize the servers were still there, because they were things like the one server that you had to have to do hybrid management, 
or because the server was off in a corner of the data center somewhere just calmly processing SMTP from multifunction printers or something. It wasn't failing, it didn't need any admin attention, so nobody paid any attention to it, so it didn't get patched. So what we learned from this as a community was patch everything all the time, and if you have things that aren't getting patched, figure out why and make sure they do get patched. But there's another reason for it too, which is more um, workforce related. A lot of the organizations that we interviewed when we wanted to get data about who's not patching and why, turns out they had people who didn't know how to patch Exchange 2016. Now, on the face of it, that sounds ridiculous, right? How could you not know that? Well, think about it, though. If you are a junior, and I'll say junior meaning less than 10 years of experience, if you're a junior Office 365 administrator and you've never put your hands on an Exchange 2016 server before, what are the odds that you would know how to patch it without doing a whole bunch of fiddling and learning and hands-on and reading, right? It's not just as simple as, oh, I'm just going to download the cumulative update and run it. It's supposed to be. That's what Microsoft has been pushing toward. But in reality, that's not always what happens, right? What happens if you have a DAG? Well, now there's other stuff you have to do. What happens if somewhere along the way you missed a hotfix? What happens if the services don't restart? What if, what if? Right? We all know those things because we went through doing them, in some cases, all the way back to you know, Exchange 4.0. But certainly, looking at the way that 2013, 2016, 2019 were all patched, if you hadn't done that before and you had to do it cold, uh, it'd be a daunting experience. Right? And that's what I attribute the popularity of this article to is we saw a big spike around the time of Hafnium and we saw another big spike around the time of Proxy Shell when the people who still didn't patch after Hafnium got hit again um, because people didn't retain that knowledge in their workforces. So my homework assignment for all of you is to think, okay, are there unique skills that I have that maybe nobody else in my organization has? And then decide, are those, are those skills, um, how do I want to put this? Are they valuable enough for me to take the time to make sure that somebody else does have them? Doesn't necessarily mean you have to teach that person, but you know, if you're the only, ad, if you're the only admin, it's not likely you're going to be able to convince somebody else to learn the intricacies of patching these servers or doing a schema update or moving a FISMO role or something. But if you have another admin, the you know, rule of thumb that I always like to use to gauge is, would I want someone to call me on my vacation to come do this thing that only I know how to do? If you're okay with that, then hey, by all means, man, keep that knowledge to yourself. But if you would rather enjoy your vacation without having somebody paid you to do something that, you know, you, where you're the only repository of knowledge, um, this is a good example of how you can help spread that knowledge around. Okay, Teams Customs Background. You know, when I started thinking about doing this session and I asked our site ops people for the list of articles, I knew there was gonna be something fluffy on the list. In other words, something that didn't have a strong operational impact. It wasn't like restore your servers or fix this important thing. It would be something kind of cotton candy. But I didn't think it would be in the number two position and I didn't think it would be Teams backgrounds. But for those of you who remember when Microsoft first shipped this feature, there was this huge groundswell of interest because people wanted to be able to customize their backgrounds. Right? And when you think about why that is, it makes perfect sense. I don't want people seeing the back of my office behind me because, man, it's a horror scape. It's got cat hair and cardboard boxes, and it's just, it doesn't present the image that I would like to present. So being able to slap up a background of something more professional looking, it was pretty nice. Um, but at first, when Microsoft first announced this, they did what they frequently do with new features. They announced the feature and they put a very limited you know, set of controls in it um, and just waited for somebody smart to figure out how to, I was gonna say subvert, that's not quite the right word. But when you think back to this feature, they gave us some bundled backgrounds and didn't give us the ability to add a custom background of our own. It turns out it was simple to do that once you found where the background files were. Microsoft could have saved everybody a lot of trouble by telling us that up front, but you know, people dug in as they do and found it. And so this ended up being our second most popular article across the entire seven year lifetime of Practical 365. Now, what's interesting to me about this as a follow on, we've had a bunch of articles about together mode and none of them 
come anywhere close to the popularity of this one article. I don't know if that's because together mode's not very customizable. I don't know if that's because people look at it and go, okay, yeah, I see how that works. Uh, I don't know if that's because people don't find that mode valuable. But this is kind of an outlier in terms of the demand for view customization um, at a point in time. All right, so I know you're all dying to know what the number one article is. And I hate to do this, but I want to prepare you and cushion you a little bit for the disappointment that's about to follow. Because when I saw this list, I was like, wait, are you even serious right now? So without further ado, and remember, there's no crying in here. The number one article is how to set up and manage Exchange SMTP relays in Exchange 2016. Yeah. Talk about letting the wind out of my sails. I thought about fiddling the list and moving that down to like number 22 so I wouldn't have to talk about it, but I figured, no, warts and all. You know, joking aside, there was a reason why this was such a popular article, and that's because Microsoft made a breaking change in 2016 that meant you had to configure relay connectors in a way that you had not previously had to. If you didn't do that, you weren't going to be moving any SMTP mail. So I can't think of another time since then when they have introduced a similar breaking change like this. I mean, there might have been one, um, but this is really the last time I can, I can visualize them in a major product release doing something that broke something that worked yesterday. Right? I can't think of them doing it in SharePoint since then, in Exchange since then, in Skype since then. The fact that it's still on top of the heap after all this time, I think if you would break this down year by year, you'd see traffic for 2021 and 2020 is like this. But man, 2015, 2016, everybody was freaked out about, oh my God, mail is not gonna flow, right? So I guess in closing, what I would say about this particular article and its position on the list is that statistics are sometimes misleading because this is a number one article by an aggregate number of hits. Is it the most popular article? I'm gonna have to go with no, right? It has the most, people who have ever read it in the history of the site. Uh, but if I ask people to pick their favorite article or the article that helped them the most, I'm not necessarily sure that this would hit that target. Okay, so I promised to have a quick commercial pitch. We are always looking for new writers, right? One thing I wanna point out right from the get-go is that we pay. I don't know what we pay, because I have you know, the marketing people try to aggressively keep me from finding that out, because I don't get paid. <laughs> we do pay, which means that instead of just promising you exposure, you know, we actually can promise you some cash money. Um, more importantly than that, though, like I said, this is an opportunity if you have unique knowledge or if you see a gap. There's so many sites out there that have so much content that sometimes it's hard to visualize there being any unique thing that you could talk about. But every one of you has got a slightly different environment from the person sitting next to you. Right? You work in different verticals. You have different business constraints. You have different communities of users who may need things that are different from sort of these, st these statistically average user that Microsoft thinks about. So the odds are pretty good that in this room, you know, out of the two or three dozen people here, many of you have got something that would be valuable for the community to see. And we give you an outlet to put it in front of people in a way that guarantees people will at least have the opportunity to see it. So the way that this works is we look for suggestions um, for articles. And so you come to us with a proposal or a suggestion, say, hey, Paul, I'd like to write an article about, um, my mind just went blank. Imagine that I had some really you know, compelling topic proposal. And our editorial staff will take a look at that and say, okay, does it meet these criteria? Right? Before you even write the article, does it actually solve a problem or is this just, is it an opinion? I'm gonna say something that's potentially controversial, but it's an opinion so I can get away with it. There are a lot of 365 focused sites where their primary value is they allow the contributors to share their opinions about things. That's not bad by any means because one of the things that is very good for the community is when we have people with diverse viewpoints sharing their opinions in a way that the community can hear them and the way that the feedback gets to Microsoft so that they get guidance on whether what they're doing is reaching their target the way they intend. But we try not to do that, right? So the first bar for content is, does it actually solve a problem or does it tell somebody how to prevent a problem? If so, 
does it guide the reader to an objective? So great example, the um, article that Damien did about managing CA policy with PowerShell. One way to write that article would be to say, you can manage conditional access policies with PowerShell. This is one commandlet, example. This is another commandlet, example. Have a nice day. Okay, well, guess what? You just reinvented docs.microsoft.com. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because you do need a sort of um, dispassionate and unguided reference to how things work in the ecosystem. But again, what we want is we want to walk people through something practical. So, hey, I'm going to show you how to create a conditional access policy that will require MFA for these particular users under these conditions. That's something concrete that a reader can look at and go, okay, I understand what I'm doing. And I see that when I get to the end, there is a specific result that I have accomplished. Because ideally what we want is we want to deliver the problem statement and then propose and walk through a solution so that the reader, when she walks away, is equipped to go, okay, now I understand that solution well enough that I can generalize it and apply it to another type of problem that I have. Great, now I know how to create a CA policy to restrict or to require conditional access. Now I want to create one to restrict the ability of unhealthy Windows 10 machines that don't have AV running to connect. Okay, that's a logical next step. We want to help people improve their understanding, right? If I just give you a script and the article is, go to GitHub, download this script and run it and it will fix your problem. That's better than not fixing the problem, but it's not as good as explaining what the script does and why you did it the way you did it. Okay, I use this commandlet because this other commandlet doesn't, you know, those of you who have had to use git msol user know exactly what I'm talking about. I use this deprecated old broke ass commandlet because the modern commandlet that's supposed to let me do things doesn't do what I want to do yet. But any minute now, it's on the roadmap, right? Then the last thing, these, this is my favorite, and you can almost kind of think of these as a, uh, a pyramid of desirability. So, you know, an okay article is one that solves a problem. A better article is one that guides the reader to solving that problem by starting with an objective and getting there. A really, really good article is going to say, hey, everybody has this problem. And one way you can solve it is this. And another way you can solve it is that. But a better, faster, cooler way to do it, more efficient, less expensive, you know, pick your metric to do it is this. Um, but all of these are, are aspects of what makes a good and popular and usable article. Okay, I went ahead and put this page in so that those of you who get the slide deck and want to um, go directly to these articles and do some compare and contrast can. In general though, you can go to practical365.com and you'll see um, between the search function and the stuff that we highlight as best bets, you'll probably be able to find content on most of the things that you actually are interested in. Okay. I wasn't sure how much free lancing I was going to be doing with asking questions because I wasn't sure how many people were going to be here. So I didn't ask as many audience questions as I'd planned. So now I'm going to turn the time over to you guys and let you ask me questions. Yes, this is my real hair. I always like to start with that one. Get a lot of questions about that. Okay, this is... So with so much stuff changing to video-based, where do you see the future of this? I know there's little parts in here like me that just want to read stuff. So that's a good question. It, it um, does seem to be changing generationally to uh, do it with your arms waving instead of just writing. That's a very good question. So Andy's question was, is there, a, you know, is there a generational shift that's driving people toward making more video content? And what do I think the, you know, that future looks like? I was watching a video earlier this morning and I enjoyed it and it was valuable because it was a video explaining the effects of spiraling slipstream on an engine failure in a multi-engine airplane. And having the guy who made the video doodling in Microsoft Paint, which is what he was using, was super valuable because he could say, okay, I've got an airplane. He drew this little cross. And you know, over here, this is the bad engine and this is a good engine. And here's what happens with the slipstream over here and here's what happens with the slipstream over here. That gave a visual illustration to the thing that a written description just couldn't do as well. 
But 90%, if not more, of what we do in this space doesn't necessarily benefit from that, right? It, I don't think there's a lot of benefit to showing somebody a screencast of, okay, this is the M365 admin portal, and I'm gonna go into the admin center, and I'm gonna click on this tab, and I'm gonna click that button, and I'm gonna click this button. It would be different if you had to click those buttons and they would randomly move around from place to place or there was an alligator in your office or something like that that made it more challenging. But in general, you know, telling people where to find it um, is probably gonna be good enough. But as I say that, um, there's a lady who does Excel training on TikTok. Now I want you to think about that for a second. There are people who are paying this person money she had her first six-figure month of selling these training courses. There are people who are paying money to receive instruction about Excel in a song and dance format in TikTok-style videos. If that's not proof that there's something going on, right, then I don't know what is. So I guess, Andy, I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm, I'm not the guy to answer that because I'm too old. I mean, literally because I can't imagine wanting to watch somebody sing and you know, do the Excel song. Uh, she actually did one that was, uh, the, the audio track was the Beatles Come Together. This is one that I happen to see. It was about combining two cell ranges. So on the one hand, holy shit, y'all, Excel is so dull. If I can have somebody singing a Beatles song and doing a little dance, it is gonna make it more interesting, right? On the other hand, did I, you know, is that necessarily how I would want to absorb that information? I don't know, it stuck with me, I will say that. So I, I think there's something there. I just don't know that every type of content that you might want to consume is amenable to that. I mean, I don't necessarily know that I want people in medical school you know, learning anatomy. Well, okay, anatomy is probably not a bad idea because that could be video based. I don't know that I want them watching TikTok videos learning how to diagnose diseases. You know? I've seen a couple that are compelling in different ways, right? And the Microsoft Mechanics Yes. Those guys do a you know, fantastic job. The best thing about it is they put the transcript right there with the video. So I can watch the first 30 seconds and say, hey, is this something that I'm going to be interested in investing my time in? And then go read the rest and skip over the book. Um, and it, give, it gives you both modalities. Yeah, right? I, I, th the I, think, I think that's a reasonable approach. I think what we're seeing, and this is a, a really welcome outgrowth of... Um, really welcome outgrowth in the diversity efforts that Microsoft and other vendors have put out. Andy, I just realized I was supposed to throw you the, the uh, microphone cube, so I will. How many of you have not seen one of these throwable cubes before? Hold it up, Andy, so everybody can see it. So this basically is just like a foam rubber cube that has the same kind of sure wireless mic that I have here, but it's got a space around the outside where a sponsor can wrap their skin. It's great for environments like this because instead of having to get up and walk across the room with the microphone and hand it to the next person, you just, just throw the cube. Um, I think you're right that having multiple modalities is gonna be more the future. Microsoft has invested hugely in transcription and recording in Teams for exactly that purpose. Right? And I like that because I can search a transcript in a way that I really can't with a video. If I'm trying to find where, where did this happen, where were we talking about X, um, it's a lot more efficient to try to do that with something that's text-based. But then you run into the problem of trying to read a transcript that's produced automatically. That can be painful, right? So definitely have some room to improve that technology. But even so, it's come so far. Those of you who have used dictation software over the years know that if you got a 95, 96% accuracy rate out of your dictation software after training it for hours and hours, that was considered to be pretty good. And now, you know, every $200 smartphone running Android has got dictation the capability that leaves that in the dust. Autocorrect still doesn't understand why I would ever use the word ducking, but you know, that's a problem for another day. <laughs> okay, anybody, who needs the cube next? All right, well, in that case, enjoy the rest of the show. I actually have a, I almost forgot to put this up. You know, normally when I come to these events, I'm affiliated with one of the sponsors, and I always kind of, you know, blitz through the thanks to our sponsors. But in this case, I'm here on my own recognizance. So 
I just want to say I really appreciate the efforts of the sponsors to enable this event to take place. I hope that all of you get a chance to go to the Expo Hall, talk to the sponsors, find out about their products and services, show them some love because they're, they're the people who made it possible for us to be here. So thanks for coming. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you next year.